Hi, everybody. This is Gad Saad for The Sad Truth. Uh, today, I'd like to briefly discuss an accusation that is commonly levied against uh, the field of evolutionary psychology, namely the idea that uh, evolutionary psychologists uh, engage in just so storytelling and hand-waving arguments whenever they seek to explain a phenomenon, when uh, the reality is that it is the exact opposite that holds true. Typically, uh, evolutionary scientists set their evidentiary threshold at a much higher level than is uh, common of the sciences in general, and certainly the social sciences in particular. And so to make this point, I've included uh, for today's uh, clip a uh, slide, which I've often used in uh, some of my uh, lectures. Uh, you'll see the slide uh, to, on, to the side of my head. I'm I need to be thankful here to my lovely wife who spent uh, about an hour a couple of days ago with me navigating through the hellish world of uh, iMovie to try to come up with uh, the means by which uh, I can split the screen so I could have this side-by-side uh, -side presentation. So thank you, lovely wife, for helping me navigate through uh, that process. And so if you... Uh, look at that slide. This is uh, in reference to a near universal known as uh, the waist to hip ratio preference of men in terms of the ideal body type that they seek in women. And we know that that waist to hip ratio preference is set at around 0.7, which is the classic hourglass figure. And so the adaptive argument as to why men would prefer that figure uh, stems from two very clear uh, expectations. One, that that particular body type would correspond to uh, greater health and would also correspond to greater fertility. Now, there is no hand-waving arguments here because studies have indeed been conducted that demonstrate that women who possess that body type are on average healthier and are on average more fertile. So there is absolutely nothing that is just so storytelling about establishing those uh, specific links. Uh, now, how do evolutionary psychologists go about establishing the near universality of that particular preference? Let's see uh, the rigor with which they tackle the problem, and then we can decide whether it's just a bunch of just so storytelling. So if you look at the slide to the side of my uh, head, uh, in the top left-hand corner, you see some uh, figure drawings. Uh, one of which corresponds to the 0.7 ratio. And so if you take these figure drawings and ask men from uh, different cultures to identify which of these body types they prefer, they tend to uh, roughly all agree that it's the 0.7 one that they prefer. And this, again, comes from studies that have been done across you know, quite different cultures. Um, also, uh, people have looked at uh, statues stemming from several millennia of uh, artifacts, uh, Indian, African, Egyptian, Greek art spanning millennia. So if you do a content analysis of the female statues stemming from those art, tra art traditions, you come up with, uh, again, the conclusion that this hourglass figure is uh, one that is preferred. Uh, you can also do studies where you look at online female escorts, as I did uh, in a study that I published in 2008. Uh, so if you see the uh, image with all the attractive female escorts on this slide, uh, this was a study wherein I did a content analysis of 48 countries. So female escorts from 48 countries. This is via the internet where uh, I coded, rather it was my undergraduate research assistant who coded uh, morphological features of these online escorts, their weight, their height, uh, their age, and their uh, waist to hip ratios. And uh, the score that I obtained, the average score was at 0.72. So already we have quite a bit of evidence that suggests that this 0.7 uh, number is quite prevalent. There's also been studies looking at uh, Playboy centerfolds spanning several decades, and it again matches roughly the 0.7. If all this is not enough, uh, I can also tell you that uh, these preferences have been elicited using traditional paper and pencil tasks, using uh, 
uh, eye tracking methodology using functional brain, uh, fun uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging or brain imaging, uh, whereby uh, the researchers showed that men's pleasure centers are more likely to li uh, light up uh, when exposed to photos of women that possess that 0.7 waist to hip ratio. Uh, you could also look at uh, pre and post uh, operative cosmetic surgeries and show that women who engage in such a uh, practice uh, seek to ameliorate their body types to fit the 0.7 ideal. And again, this comes from different cultures. Uh, and if all of this evidence is still not enough for you, uh, then you could take, if you look at the bottom right-hand corner of the slide, uh, there I show a blind man and so three uh, brilliant researchers a few years ago did a study where they took congenitally blind men. So these are men who've never had the gift of eyesight. Uh, and they had them uh, go through a task uh, to elicit their waist-to-hip ratio preferences. And they chose a waist-to-hip preference of 0.7. Now you might say, well, how did they go about uh, doing such a task since obviously they can't see? Well, it turns out that they applied a haptic paradigm. They, they actually touched mannequins that had uh, different body uh, types, different waist to hip ratios, and they chose the one that corresponds to the hourglass figure. So they certainly couldn't have been socialized into that preference, since by definition, they've never been able to see any media images and so on. So taken together, you've got data stemming from extraordinarily different methodologies, different paradigms, different cultures, all of which point to uh, this near universal preference of 0.7. By the way, I call it near universal and not universal, precisely because evolutionary psychologists also recognize that men's waist to hip ratio preferences can change as a function of local niches. So in environments where there is a recurring and endemic uh, caloric scarcity, or say, for example, famines, uh, then men's uh, body type preferences will shift towards a higher waist-to-hip ratio. And so this demonstrates the malleability of uh, preferences. So it might start off with a preference of 0.7, but it could be tuned uh, one way or the other depending on local niches. And so the idea that, for example, evolutionary psychology is uh, genetic determinism is absolutely false as demonstrated by the example that I just gave. And so those who proclaim that evolutionary psychologists engage in just so storytelling are either profoundly ignorant about the field and or they are so ideologically driven in their disdain for evolutionary theory that they're willing to ignore this reality if only to demonstrate uh, resistance against the field. Uh, so again, I hope that one day soon we will uh, lay this uh, accusation to rest uh, because as I hope I've shown in this uh, video, uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, evolutionary psychologists truly do engage in a very, very rich epistemology. They build these nomological networks of cumulative evidence and uh, constructing an adaptive argument. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, come back again soon. Talk to you later. Ciao.